good morning in the previous classes on economics I have told that the important measure that signals a strong or a weak economy lies in the wealth that a particular nation or an economy is able to generate. And while measuring the wealth, the qualitative nature of growth lies in the output that the economy is able to generate. And that is why I was insisting that it is the output that actually measures the real wealth of an economy than just the circulation of money. However, that does not mean that money is not important. It is that one particular form of wealth that is essential for any economy to function. So, although output is more important than wealth in the study of macroeconomics, we need to understand the importance of money, because that is one particular form of wealth that actually ties together various macroeconomic variables. Let us understand why. Now, if you ask the question, why is that the study of money is very important? There are a number of reasons for that. As I said before, it is money that actually acts as the fuel for any economic activity. And for the economic activity to grow or if an economic activity falls, it is because either there is money or there is no money. So, we must understand that it is the fuel that actually runs the economic engine. Now, in the absence of money, let us think how an economy will function. An economy functions because people and institutions buy goods and services, buy or sell goods and services. And the transaction that involves the buying and selling gets complicated in the absence of money. Let us assume that there is no money in an economy and that I am a farmer and that I go grow grain. And once the cultivation period is over, I will have to sell the grains. Then I will have to look for a purchaser who is willing to accept grains and in return give me something that is useful for my personal consumption in the absence of money. So, if I feel that at that point of time that I need furniture to build a house, I am willing to give my grain to somebody who is willing to exchange grain in return for furniture. Likewise, I need uh, let us say some basic necessities for domestic survival. So, I need to just look for somebody else who is willing to again accept the grain that I have in exchange of some of the domestic necessities that I need. So, this form of exchange between products to secure an alternate product gets a little complicated. It does not mean it is not possible, but it is little complicated. Now, we need to link all such products and services and facilitate a system in which a barter system that I explained before is replaced by an easy exchange of goods and services that can be purchased and sold by a common currency that a common unit in this case is money. So, when we need to migrate from a barter system to a currency system, everybody needs to accept one form of currency in exchange of goods and services. So, I have grains with me, I just sell it to somebody else who is ready to give me money for that and with that money I purchase furniture, I purchase domestic supplies that I need for my domestic survival. So, an exchange a migration from a complicated barter system wherein goods were sold and purchased 
by exchanging goods and services to a system where the same thing happens, but in return it is the currency that gets transacted. As a result of which today we see every country has its own currency and it is that currency that is used to facilitate trade that facilitates the exchange of goods and services. And every country is every country's currency the strength or weakness of a country's currency is measured against a universal currency and in today's perspective the US dollar is the universal currency and there are there is a history to the emergence of US dollar as the universal currency I am not just going to go and explain, but it is enough for you to understand that the US dollar is accepted as the universal currency against which every country's currency every con every country's currency strength or weakness is measured relative to. And if we need to import or export it is the dollar that acts as the common denominator. In fact, after the world wars it it the it was the American economy that actually took a great risk because we needed to have a common currency and the the American the American government decided to pledge its entire gold reserves which which actually uh, if these gold reserves were reduced to a rope of a half inch thick thickness it was enough to go around the world twice. So, that that is the extent of the gold reserve that the American government had at that point of time and then it decided to pledge the entire gold reserves to to hedge the US dollar. So, the US dollar at that point of time so for for 1 ounce of gold 35 dollars was the equivalent amount. So, that was the risk the American government took at that point of time to ensure that the US dollar is accepted as a global currency and anybody with gold let us say 1 ounce of gold if you give you get 35 dollars. So, this is this is the history of how the US dollar gained significance as the global currency and of course, after the Vietnam war and other economic activities then it was decided that no longer uh, the the American government could uh, afford to pledge its gold reserves to maintain the relative strength of the US dollar it decided to take take the gold reserves out and then came the Washington consensus and all these things that were the, the currency uh, uh, freely floating currencies of individual nations against the US dollar all of this happened, but it is enough for you to understand that no longer was gold reserves protecting this the American gold reserves was protecting the strength of the US dollar then in this free market economy it was the relative strength of each country's currency vis a vis the USD currency which is still the global currency that was that was the one that decided whether a particular country's currency is gaining strength or losing strength vis a vis the American dollar. Now, let us get back to the discussion on money it is enough for you to understand that for global trade we need US dollars. Now, I said the, 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 the understanding of money is very important, because the money affects many economic variables and I am going to just concentrate on three macroeconomic variables namely the interest rate, the exchange rate and inflation. How money affects these three macroeconomic variables, because to me all these three in a way constitute the price of money that the cost of money let us see how. Let us begin with interest rate. Now, interest rate a simple definition is cost of holding money or the cost of investment fund. Suppose, I decide to put some deposit in a bank the return that I get is measured by the interest rate that the bank is willing to give on the deposits that I have with the bank or suppose I need to borrow money from the bank as a business. The cost of borrowal is measured in terms of the interest rate based on which I will have to pay interest as an expense for borrowing the money from the bank. This is the simple definition of interest rate, but if you look at 
the, the conception of money. Now, many would prefer receiving rupees 100 now than rupees the, the same rupees 100 one year from now as cash. The reason is the value of money itself will change over a period of time and that is called the time value of money. And now what decides the value of money is the interest rate. Today if I have 100 rupees, I am not sure whether one year later the value of this 100 rupees is the same 100, whether it has increased or decreased depends on the prevailing interest rate. And it is this interest rate that actually makes businesses or individual consumers to take decisions whether they need to borrow now to consume or borrow now to invest in a business. If I have a business proposal in which I feel that the return on investment that I am going to get on the business proposal is more than the prevailing interest rates, then I borrow and put that money in my business as a result of which I earn returns whose the return the returns is more than the interest rate. So, I am able to compensate for my interest expense. So, it is this interest rate that is actually the cost of money. Now, if interest rate rises, it means the cost of money rises, it means money is getting expensive. Now, if money is getting expensive, then there is a direct impact on consumerism. So, I would not be borrowing more to engage in consumerism nor are businesses interested in borrowing at higher costs as a result of which business investment drops. So, we need to understand that interest rate is one macroeconomic variable which is affected by the excess or the, low, the, the lower supply of money. The second variable that we need to understand is the exchange rate. As I said before, it is the price of one particular currency with respect to another. And as I said, the, the US dollar is the global currency, usually the strength of a currency is measured against the US dollar. In this case, let us for example, say that the, the uh, rupee dollar exchange rate is 50, which means for every dollar rupees 50 is the value. Now, either a currency will strengthen or weaken against the US dollar. It means either the currency appreciates or depreciates. Now, for an economy, an economy as I said before is an aggregate of different types of economic activities. There is agriculture, there is services, there is industry and within this there is exports there is imports. So, the, the movements in the currency vis a vis the US dollar measured as whether it is depreciating or appreciating affects different economic players in different ways. Let us for example, say understand what happens when a currency depreciates. It means that if today the, the value of rupee against the dollar is like for a dollar as I said is 50 rupees and if the currency depreciates, it means that the rupee is losing its value vis a vis the US dollar. Now, how is it going to affect different economic players? It is good news for exporters because for every dollar of business that they export they are going to get more rupee denominated revenue, because no longer is rupee 50, let us say it is 60 rupees. So, for every dollar exports instead of receiving 50 rupees, they receive 60 rupees. It is good news for foreign tourists who are coming here to India, which means for a dollar that they give in return, they get more Indian currency that they can spend on Indian soil. But it is bad for importers, because the foreign purchases now become expensive, thereby it reduces the overall purchasing power. Which means, today if I am paying 
uh, 50 rupees for a dollar purchase I will have to shell out more which means I will have to pay 60 rupees for the same dollar purchase. So, if I am importing goods and services as a result of which a currency depreciation is bad news for importers. Now, contrary to that if a currency appreciates then the exact opposite it is good news for importers suppose I want to go on a foreign vacation I need to purchase dollars which means I will have to pay less than 50 rupees to purchase 1 dollar if my currency appreciates. So, as, as somebody who wants to go on a foreign vacation it is good news for me. So, the, the fluctuations in the exchange rate because of which the domestic currency either loses or gains strength vis a vis the US dollar affects different business enterprises, different econo economic activities in different ways. It, it, is, it is based on who the economic entity is whether it is an exporter or an importer or a, or a foreign tourist or an uh, Indian who wants to go abroad on vacation. So, different stakeholders are affected different ways because of fluctuations in exchange rate. And an exchange rate is again affected by money. The third macroeconomic variable is the inflation. Now, inflation at a very broad sense is the is the aggregate price level. It, it is the average price of all goods and services. It is not just price of one good, it is a weighted average it measures inflation actually measures the weight if I say 6 percent what does it mean? It means it, 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 it measures the weighted average price rise of a basket of goods when compared to what it was before. So, it is this basket of goods that is actually the measure it, 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 it actually the basket of goods and services that are included in calculating the weighted average price is symbolic of the nation's economy. It could it would include housing, it could include food prices, medicine, oil, clothing all this. So, it is that price of goods and services which in terms of express in terms of money which either rises or goes down is measured by is, is, is actually inflation. And if you look at a functioning economy a healthy economy you would find that price keeps changing all times sometimes the price may rise sometimes the price may fall sometimes price may rise for a particular commodities price may fall for certain set of commodities. But if let us say there is a prevailing inflation in the economy then we would find across the board almost the price of all the goods and services will increase. And if it is deflation likewise across the board the price of all the goods and services will fall. Now, what happens to the value of money with price change? I will just give you an example for you to understand. Let us say we I, I, I have a house whose values uh, which I purchased 10 years back for 100,000 rupees 1 lakh and today the value of the house is 10 lakhs. Now, people call this as the value of the house, the house has remained the same it was I purchased it for 1 lakh 10 years back and today it is 10 lakh. The, the value appreciation in the house people take it as though the house has acquired some value actually it means that 10 years back with 1 lakh of rupees I was able to purchase this house and 10 years later with the same 1 lakh of rupees I am not able to purchase this house. It essentially means that the purchasing power of the money has reduced. It is of course, it, it is people think that the value of the house has increased not disagreeing to that we must understand that with the same 1 lakh the purchasing power of the same house has reduced by 1 tenth which means the value of the money has reduced. 
we will understand about this as we go further in understanding the concepts of inflation. Now, there are actually two reasons for inflation. One is the demand pull inflation. A demand pull inflation is an inflation in which there is more demand than the supply. Typically, such a situation will arise when there is excess money supply due to a loose monetary supply, due, due to a loose monetary policy. I will explain what it is later. But let us understand uh, through a graph how the demand pull inflation can be explained. Suppose, uh, as I said before, a demand pull inflation normally results from excess demand generated by a loose monetary policy, where there is uh, more supply, less supply, more demand. So, previously we know that our supply demand curve is like this. So, this is a price, this is a quantity and I am trying to explain the, the demand pull inflation. And this is because of an increase in demand. So, notice that the demand has increased from D 1 to D 2 and inflation means rise in price. So, you notice that the price has increased from P 1 to P 2. So, as demand shifts from D 1 to D 2, we notice that the price shifts from P 1 to P 2 with no change in supply, because volumes cannot increase sufficiently to accommodate additional demand, especially at a time when the economy is functioning at its maximum capacity. So, this is the, this is an inflation that is called a demand pull inflation, which is basically the demand is more than supply and it is because of the excess money supply. And this demand, additional demand is not being compensated by additional supplies, because already the economy is at maximum capacity as a result of which the volumes cannot increase sufficiently to meet the increase in demand as a result of which you near notice this price increase P 1 to P 2. So, this is the demand pull inflation. Now, just as we have demand pull inflation, there is also another reason for inflation, which is the cost push inflation. Again here in cost push inflation, the prices increase, I will again try to explain this using a graph, so that you will understand that a cost push inflation is prices rise even when the economy is not operating at full capacity. The reasons for that could be either due to a crop failure or currency devaluation or imports getting expense, uh, expensive or uh, a wage increases, but there is no corresponding increase in productivity. So, these are all different reasons to for price increase as a result of cost push inflation, because the economy is not at maximum, but still prices keep increasing. So, what does that mean? So, I will just explain it again using a graph price quantity to explain cost push inflation. So, what happens here is demand supply so for this one the support price is P 1 Q 1. let us say this is the new supply as a result of which P 2 Q 2. 
the product supply curve shifts upward due to higher costs and as a result of which this one drops because as cost increases the output that is produced will decrease because we cannot produce the same level of output at higher input costs and this is what you see in this graph as a result of which the output reduces and when that hits the demand curve at this price you will notice that P 1 has increased from P 2. This explains uh, the cost push inflation which results in price increase as a result of as a result of increasing costs and at a time when not the, the economic activity is not at its full capacity. Now, a demand pull if there is a demand pull inflation it is usually handled by a tighter fiscal and monetary policy that, that, that tries to control the availability of money and this we will understand when we talk about the fiscal and monetary policies. A cost push inflation is handled by ensuring that there is either cost efficiency either you reduce the cost of inputs or increased productivity or try to produce more. This is the way in which we will handle cost push. Now, instead of resort, resorting to such economically accepted ways of handling inflation, there is also another method by which a direct intervention by the government through price controls can also be a temporary measure to address inflation. Here let us say this is the demand supply and this is to explain price control. This is the existing price. The government occasionally resorts to price control to prevent large price increases, but price controls are basically as I told you temporary palliatives to price surges of products and commodities. Now, if the government says this is the price at which things have to work, then there is this supply gap. because this is the quantity of supply, this is the quantity, this becomes the quantity demanded. So, price controls are short term and very counterproductive in a long term because they discourage production and worsen the gap between demand and supply. But this is very rarely uh, an accepted form of trying to combat inflation. Usually inflation is handled by a fiscal or a monetary policy or attempts to be more cost efficient and increase productivity. So, this is about inflation. The the next We know that money affects three variables as I said before, the interest rate, the exchange rate and inflation and I call that as the three prices of money, one which is relative to time which is the interest rate, the other it is relative to a foreign currency which is the exchange rate and a price that is relative to all goods and services that is the aggregate price level or the inflation. Now, how the quantity of money affects all these three variables is an interesting subject matter of study. We need to understand how excessive money or presence of limited amount of money affects interest rates, exchange rate or aggregate price level or vice versa as well. Now, let us first begin with uh, interest rates. 
Now, we need to understand that changes of money supply affects interest rate, exchange rate and, and the way in which it changes that is a complex subject of study by itself, but I will just try to explain at a very very fundamental level as to how money supply increases if let us say money supply increases what happens to interest rates. Now, suppose money supply increases the interest rate falls why it is just as if there is more number of goods what happens to the price of the goods it will fall down because the price of good will fall down if there is more of it available in the market. Likewise more money means the price of money in this case is an interest rate it will fall down. Let us say there is more oil in the global market the price of an oil barrel will fall down likewise if there is more amount of money in circulation then the cost at which you need to purchase the money will fall down. If there is more money what happens to exchange rate? Let us let us understand the law of supply and demand to explain this. Let us for example, say that there is a policy where for every automobile I am just taking an automobile industry to explain this how what happens to exchange rates. Let us say if every every car manufacturer is supposed to source engine from a particular manufacturer in the US as a result of which the demand for that particular engine will keep on increasing and if I need to purchase that particular engine from the US I will have to have enough US dollars to purchase that engine as a result of which the demand for the US dollar will increase. So, the US dollar will appreciate. So, what does it mean my currency will depreciate. So, this explains how the the demand for the US dollar will cause a depreciation of other currencies relative to the US dollar. The third thing is increased money supply is also inflationary what, what do I mean by that it means if there is more money more money without a proportionate increase in the output means more money is chasing the same amount of goods as a result of which there is price increase that is why I said increase in money supply is inflationary more money chasing fewer goods results to price increase. So, there is a standard relationship that we need to understand the relationship is if there is increase in money supply the interest rates will fall the exchange rate will depreciate or the price level will increase or in that is inflation and there is a symmetry in this relationship as a result of which the opposite the contrary is also true that is when there is a decrease in money supply you will find that the interest rate rises the exchange rate appreciates appreciates and price level falls it is called deflation. So, this is how there is a relationship between the the supply of money and the interest rate exchange rate and inflation. Now, let us dissect this to understand it better by beginning with interest rates. Now, what do I mean by interest rate? What you see in the newspaper, what you see here in the news that is the nominal interest rate the rate that the bank quotes the rate that you see in the newspaper these are all nominal interest rates suppose the bank says that the cost of a loan is 5 percent it means the nominal rate of interest for the loan is 5 percent. Now, let us say inflation is 3 percent let us assume now the inflation is 3 percent now what will happen to the nominal interest rate it is 5 plus 3 percent I had explained this concept before when we were handling GDP it becomes 8 percent. 
So, the real interest rate is 5 percent only, the real interest rate is 5 percent, the resultant nominal interest rate is to cover the inflation of 3 percent. I will just give you a small example for you to understand this. Let us say I am a, uh, there were two people and one wanted to borrow cows from the other. Now, the understanding was I borrow 10 cows from somebody who was willing to lend me 10 cows and one year later I was prepared to give 11 cows in return. So, measured by way of the number of cows borrowed and returned the cost of this transaction was 10 percent because from 10 cows I had to return him 11 cows and this I did one year. At the end of the year I gave back 11 cows and the cost of uh, borrowing was 10 percent. Now, next year also I wanted to do the same transaction, but the difference was instead of cows I said I will borrow cash and return cash right. So, let us say the cost of 1 cow at the time of borrowing was rupees 1000, so which means I borrowed 10,000 and at the end of 1 year I had to give 11,000 because the cost of interest for the same borrowing was 10 percent. Now, let us say during this period there was a price increase of let us say 10 percent and the cost of the cow at the end of one year was 1100, it was 1000 before and 1100. So, during repayment time since I borrowed in cash and I have agreed to repay in cash, I am repaying 11000 rupees right. Now, with this 11000 rupees when I receive let us say I am the I am the person who loaned out 10,000 rupees and at the end of one year I receive 11,000 rupees and with this 11,000 rupees if I decide to buy 10 cows, how much will I have to spend? I will have to spend the entire 11,000, reason the cost of the cow is no longer 1000, inflation has resulted in increase in the price of cow as a result of which now with the same 11,000 I can buy only 10 cows. Does it mean that there was no interest at all in this transaction? It appears to be that is why we need to understand the effective real rate of interest. The question is what should be the nominal interest rate to gain an effective real interest rate of 10 percent with regard to output and not the money. The answer is a simple 21 percent, how did I get this 21 percent? This 21 percent is 10,000 is the principal plus an interest of 2100 which needs to cover the inflation as well as the real interest rate of 10 percent. So, only if I am compensated for inflation at an effective real rate of 21 percent would I say that this transaction is beneficial. If you ignore this then the focus is on the nominal rates and not the real interest rate our focus should be on the real interest rate because it is output that actually matters and not money. So, in assessing the cost of borrowing the real rates is more important than the nominal rates, but we need to understand that it is a tough and then very ambiguous relationship between money growth and interest rate because let me just explain it using a small illustration. The previous illustration was for you to understand that if the price of 
cows had increased by one tenth, then I would have had to roughly double the nominal rate of interest to preserve a real rate of interest in terms of the cows of 10 percent. Now, it is not as easy as things are explained that the money growth versus interest rate, the relationship between money growth and interest rate is not as easy as it is theoretically understood. If you look at the let us say increase in money supply, normally when a bank increases the money supply, short term interest rates are expected to fall. I am talking about nominal interest rates. However, growth in money supply particularly if it is substantial may also spark some inflationary expectations, right. So, inflation may rise because of this there is a substantive increase in the money supply there is inflation and if inflation takes hold short term nominal interest rates will eventually rise as well and because of these conflicting pressures the ultimate effect on the interest rate and money supply because of this large money supply if you need to understand the relationship it gets a little ambiguous because as I explained before there is a pressure on the real interest rate. real interest rates are very likely to fall. So, what happens to the nominal rate? Long term nominal rates may fall, rise or stay the same depending on what happens to the inflationary expectations. The this relationship is a little complicated because as I said before if there is an increase in money supply if you look at this if there is an increase in money supply short term interest rates will fall and if there is more increase in the money supply the inflation will rise as a result of which uh, if the short term nominal interest should also have to rise and because of this conflicting pressures the ultimate effect on the nominal interest rates uh, of a large increase in money supply is a little ambiguous. Now, this is a little complicated subject to understand, but we need to understand that the, the money supply and interest rates the relationship between money supply and interest rate is important for any macroeconomic decision making. And the interest rate, the rate at which the interest rate changes must also be understood from the perspective of the inflation, because we are more interested in the real interest rate and not the nominal rate of interest as I explained before in the examples of the cows. The in assessing the cost of borrowing we should account for inflation because it is the real rate that is more important than the nominal rates. So, now this is the first macroeconomic variable that is the interest rates. The next class I will also discuss about the other macroeconomic variables namely the exchange rate and how the exchange rate behavior also changes with inflation just as interest rate behavior changes with inflation how exchange rate also changes with inflation thank you